it's good to see you here, Seven Christian Church. Uh, we're happy that you're here. Uh, we are starting a new sermon series through uh, Philippians. Really excited about it. Um, the Word of God is a true treasure and a joy to us, and uh, and so we hope that you'll take this journey with us for the next six or seven weeks um, as we explore what Paul has to say in the book of Philippians. Um, but before we get there, uh, I want to talk to you for a few moments um, about prison. Can you imagine, right, maybe some of you have actually been in prison or in jail um, here and you've turned your life around and you've given your life to Jesus and and things are new, but can you imagine being in a prison um, for the majority of your life? I mean, think about that for a moment. Everyone else dictates what you do, what you say, what you eat, um, how you live your life, and you're under constant control of the prison authorities. I've given you some of the top worst prisons in the world. Um, The first one is called Black Dolphin Prison in Russia. And this prison houses the worst criminals in Russia that you can ever imagine. Murderers, rapists, pedophiles, cannibals, and they treat them extremely rough. Um, From the time they wake up to the time that they go to sleep, they're not allowed to sit or relax or take a moment to themselves. Anytime they're transported, they're blindfolded, handcuffed, and put in a submissive position as they're transported around um, the security of the prison. They are beaten, um, they are starved, and they are treated pretty harshly, but they are criminals. Number two is called Bang Quang Prison in Bangkok, and they are notorious for inflicting brutal mental and physical torture on inmates. Um, They house some of the most criminal inmates in the country. Um, They only receive one bowl of rice um, soup per day. Think about that. Only one soup a day. And those on death row have leg irons um, strapped around their ankles that reach up to the wrist, and that's how they stay 24-7. That's a pretty terrible uh, prison sentence, wouldn't you agree? Number three is a maximum security prison in Kenya, and they have extreme violence and rape that occurs in this prison. Apart from the dismal conditions of this place, which includes extreme overcrowding, the heat and the water are completely unbearable. The prison is known for its violence. Both fights between prisoners and beatings from the, uh, from the guards happen on a regular basis, and rape is an extremely huge problem inside this prison. And then finally, number four is a central prison in Rwanda. The prison was built to house 600 people, and it actually houses 6,000. It's referred to as hell on earth by those who have seen it. They are stacked on top of each other like cattle. The facilities and the extreme torture that they undergo makes it almost unbearable. Danger and disease is rampant, and the conditions are unimaginable for us. And I want you to think about being in one of these prisons and writing these words of the Apostle Paul, always be joyful in the Lord. Again, I say, always be joyful. Undergoing something like this, especially being innocent like the Apostle Paul was, being persecuted for the sake of the gospel, is something that we would have a really hard time grasping and dealing with. We suffer things like disease, discomfort, torture, the loss of the unborn child, the loss of a loved one. Um, We go through things that are really hard for us to deal with. And often, and I find myself crying out to God, asking, why is it me that has to go through this? Why is it me that has to suffer this? God, please protect me. Please shelter me. Don't make me go through this because it hurts and it's painful. But yet the Apostle Paul was in prison when he was writing to the church at Philippi. He was writing to them and he was sharing how always be joyful no matter what. You want to talk about having true joy. What an amazing experience. Before we get to the book of Philippians, I want to tell you a little bit about the church at Philippi. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16. The Apostle Paul founded the church at Philippi. Um, it was based in the province of Macedonia, and, um, and Paul traveled there, and he set up this church with Silas and Timothy. And we find in Acts chapter 16, we find the calling of Paul going to start this church to preach them the gospel in verse 9. It says in Acts chapter 16, verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia, Philippi was in Macedonia, standing and begging him. Come over to Macedonia and help us. 
And after Paul had seen the vision, uh, we, this is Luke, who's writing the book of Acts, who's talking uh, about his, his trip with Paul, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here is Paul, experiencing a vision of a man begging him to come share the good news of Jesus Christ in Philippi. And he founded this church, but it was not easy. Paul, the Apostle Paul, went through a horrendous life, in prison unjustly, beaten, whipped, left naked. In fact, he was actually stoned in Acts chapter 17, left for dead. He experienced paradise, what's called the third heaven, and he recounts that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And he talks about, I was called up to the third heaven. Whether I was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. But he was stoned. And if you know what being stoned is, it's not when you smoke marijuana. Being stoned is when somebody takes a stone and they throw it at your body until you no longer are alive. A terrible thing to undergo and have to, and have to partake in. So he goes to the church at Philippi, and he begins to preach and teach and share the good news with them, and it is not easy. He's got this nagging, demon-possessed girl who follows them all over the place, mocking them and laughing at them. I mean, think about that for a second. Think about being at your workplace, and every time you come in, you've got somebody who has something smart I like to say about your Christianity. Or every time you're in a conversation with somebody and they swear, they slip up, they mock you because you're a follower of Jesus. The Apostle Paul had this girl that followed them around all of the time. But it didn't just have heartache and pain, there was also rejoicing. He baptized a woman named Lydia, who was a wealthy woman, and her whole believing household were baptized into Christ because of the gospel. Um, But during that time, not only did he have this demon-possessed woman following them, who he later went on to rebuke and cast out the demon, but they were beaten. They were put in prison. In fact, they were beaten and put in prison, and Paul used that prison sentence as an opportunity to win more people to Christ. If you'll look on through Acts chapter 16, around verse 29, we're going to read it here in a few seconds, but basically, Paul was preaching the gospel, and the Jews didn't like it because he was preaching Jesus Christ the Messiah. And so they sentenced him to prison, and he's sitting in prison uh, with his buddy Silas, and a great earthquake takes place, right? A great earthquake takes place, and the chains are loosed, and the prison doors are open, um, and yet we find Paul and Silas are not crying, not worried about their situation. They're joyful, and they're singing praises to God. They're singing hymns, spiritual songs and hymns. And can you imagine that? sitting in this dirty, nasty, dark prison, in chains for something you didn't do, and yet you're so full of joy that you're singing praises to God. And look at Acts chapter 16, verse 29. Um, After this earthquake, um, the the jailer is very concerned because if you were a Roman jailer and your prison uh, inmates escaped, they they would kill you. And so naturally, he's really upset. He rushes in, and it says he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? People are always listening. Here was this jailer and these other inmates listening to Paul and Silas praise God in the midst of their persecution. And he says, what must I do to be saved? And look at verse 31. It says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved in all of your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together and all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and told them to wait until Easter Sunday before they get baptized. That's not what it says, is it? Look at their response. And immediately... He was baptized, he and all of his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them, and they rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. So you can see what Paul was going through and the type of persecution that he's undergoing, and yet he still has joy. He's still giving thanks and starting the church at Philippi. Fast forward about four years later, and here is Paul revisiting this church once again from a prison with a, with a guard by his side under house arrest, and he's writing to the Philippians about having joy and unity and love. I don't know whether you're a pessimist or an optimist, whether you always see the bad things in life or you cling on to the good, but the Bible was very clear. We should always rejoice, being full of the Spirit, looking for the silver lining in life, clinging on to the hope of the gospel. That should bring us true joy. 
And in his letter to the Ephesians, he actually wrote uh, Philippians and Ephesians, he says that I am a bondservant. I am enslaved in these chains for the Lord and for the gospel. And yet, Paul is still not concerned about himself, but about fellow Christians. So turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Now that we've got some background about this, here is Paul writing to them from a prison, and he's had extreme persecution. It was a nightmare getting to Rome, okay? We're talking about shipwrecks, beatings, bitings from snakes, um, almost getting killed. I mean, this guy really went through a lot of stuff. And he, he introduces us to this letter here in verse 1 where he says this, Paul and Timothy bond servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul would ever write letters, he would refer to himself as an apostle. But here, he doesn't do that. And the reason why he doesn't do that is because Paul was attempting to set the tone for, for the letter to the Philippians. He wants everyone to be on the same page. He doesn't want anybody to feel inferior to him, and he certainly doesn't want other people to try to look up to him in this moment because he's getting ready to write about unity, about love, and that's what this church was having a problem with. They were having a problem with unity. And of course, he cites himself, letting them know who this letter is coming from. Remember, it was me, the Apostle Paul, who founded this church, who loved you and baptized you and taught you the way of the Lord. And he calls himself a bond servant, right? That's kind of a weird term. If you don't know what a bond servant is, it comes from the Greek word douloi, and it means this, a slave of Christ. Paul would often refer to himself as a slave of Christ, a person that has been bought and paid for with the price of Jesus Christ's blood. It means that he is totally unselfish. It means that he's not willing to take anything for himself, but he's willing to lay it all out on the line for the sake of spreading the gospel. A bondservant who has been bought. And you know Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When he's talking to the Corinthian church, he says, you have been bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so Paul here is leveling with them. And I think that's something that we should do too. When we talk amongst each other, when we share the gospel with each other, when we share the gospel with people that are our family or friends, we should know our proper role. We are first and foremost a servant here to do the will of God. And he says this, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now there, and some of you might have actually watched the news about Mother Teresa, who's just been set apart um, uh, as a saint. Um, She has been canonized as a saint. Actually, the Bible doctrine teaches that all Christians, the moment that they are baptized into Christ, become a saint. Right? And this is pretty cool. The word saint means set apart. It means to be set apart for holiness. If you were to look and do a study in the Old Testament, you would find that the people of God, the Israelites, were saints. They were set apart to be a holy nation to produce the Messiah. And when we become Christians, when we decide to follow Jesus, we actually are recognized and set apart as a saint by God himself. You don't have to pray to saints because you are one. You don't have to perform miracles to become a saint, for Christ declared you as a set-apart child of God. In seven different times in this epistle, he refers to this congregation, all the saints. All the saints. You see, he's wanting these Christians to understand something, that I am addressing the entire congregation. I'm not showing favoritism. No one is above you. I'm just going to address you as Paul, not the Apostle Paul. It would be like an elder simply addressing you as a brother or an evangelist like myself or Clyde simply addressing you as a servant of God. No favoritism. You see, we as Christians, if we are saints, which we are, we should be living a lifestyle that is set apart and is holy. It is not just for the religious elite to be set apart. And that's what Paul's getting across here. You, each and every one of you, are saints chosen by God, set apart to be a special people. Peter actually wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says to the, to the Christians that he's writing to, not just the special people, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see, the universal doctrine 
of being a set-apart saint of God needs to be rescued from the falsehood that's been imposed upon it. And it starts not only with what we teach and what we preach, but how we live our lives. We can't rely on the preacher or the elders or Mother Teresa to be set apart for us. That those are the really special people who do all the wonderful things, and I'm over here living a struggling life. Absolutely not. We are all saints called to be a chosen, royal, holy people set apart by God to do his work. He says, not only are you saints, but you are saints in who? In Christ Jesus. You are unique. You are special. Not because of what you do, not because of who says you are, but simply because Christ is in you. And then I think this is interesting. He goes on to call out selectively. He says, and also to the overseers and deacons, right? It's not that he was making two different classes, but that he was emphasizing that it starts with the leaders. If I'm going to teach you about unity, Paul was saying, if I'm going to teach you about love, if I'm going to teach you about joy and thanksgiving and hope, it starts with the leaders of the church. An overseer would be somebody who would supervise, protect. They were not lords, they were not cardinals, they were not popes, they were not church boards. They were caregivers of souls, dealing with people. They were not closet decision makers, but they were people actively involved in the congregation, making phone calls, sending emails, face-to-face visits, checking up on people, and teaching people about the gospel of Jesus. You know, I, uh, one of my favorite movies called Remember the Titans. Anybody seen Remember the Titans? Oh yeah. Like we would watch that before every football game to get super pumped up. And uh, one of my favorite parts that I remember is when they're having practice time. And of course, this is one of the first schools in West Virginia that's combining black people and white people, right? So it was during, during that segregation time. And so it was a mixed team and they were trying to learn how to play together. And, of course, one of the uh, more popular players on the team was a middle linebacker. That's what position I played in high school. Uh, it's a fun position. You get to hit all the time, and it's, it's just great. And so this guy was a beast. I mean, he was, he was a beast. Not like uh, I wasn't, but he was. And, and so he's the captain, right? He's a white guy. He's a captain. And um, one of his outside linebackers, who was the, the weak side linebacker, so you've got the strong side, um, and then you've got the weak side. It's football stuff. Anyways, so they're having problems in practice, right? And so the weak side linebacker has an attitude problem. There's disunity. There's division. And they're going to get a drink of water. And the captain decides to call him out, right? Decides to call him out right then and there, saying, it's your fault that we have disunity. You need to be more humble. You need to do this. You need to do that. And the simple response was, attitude reflects leadership, captain. And that if you want this team to be unified, If you want us to play together, it starts with you. And isn't that true? Attitude, I would go on to say, attitude and action reflects leadership. That if you want your family to be a follower of Jesus, parents, it's got to start with you. If we as a church want to focus on thanksgiving and love and harmony and joy and tough times, it's got to start with us. And that's why I think he selects the overseers and the deacons, and he says, guys, it starts with you. And that's something that we need to constantly remind ourselves of. So an overseer was a protector. He was a caregiver of souls, but a deacon was a servant specialized to perform tasks in the church. You see, there are a lot of stuff in this church that our deacons take care of, whether it's mowing the lawn or overseeing a class or fixing something here or doing something there or visiting someone or picking someone up, and that type of work is needed all of the time. And the reasons why deacons were created in the church was so that they could tend to those things so that the apostles and the evangelists could share the gospel. If I was weighed down every day of the week with overseeing stuff and administrating stuff, I wouldn't have any time to teach anybody. And so we work together, and that's what Paul was saying. We have to be unified together. And so here's the key phrase. The first key phrase this morning is simply this, is that each and every one of you are especially important. You are a saint You are set apart. You have a role to play in the unity of the church. And so Paul goes on to say, if you'll go with me in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always offering up prayer with joy in uh, in every prayer um, for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day Jesus Christ returns. Here's the first thing. 
The key to having joy, the key to making it through the tough times is to give thanks. You know, when Angel and I first moved uh, here to Maryland, it was, it was not easy. Um, we came uh, from Winchester, Virginia, three years ago, February 11th, 2013. And the move up here, it cost thousands of dollars to move. Um, Angel, she worked at Costco in Sterling, Virginia. And so basically, if you can imagine a map of Maryland, um, she was commuting from here to Sterling. But now that we're up at Maryland, she's commuting back um, to Sterling. And she's having to take the highway of hell, known as 495, if you've ever driven on that. Yes, it is literally torture. Um, and, and so she's, her body's breaking down. She's extremely stressed. Um, sitting in that type of traffic for two hours one way, when it should be a 40-minute drive, it wears on you. So she'd have to leave at 5 o'clock in the morning, and we were looking for apartments. And uh, I found this apartment that was recently renovated. What could be better, right? And so we go to this apartment in Prince George's County, and it is in the slums, okay? Didn't know, but it is in the slums. And the apartment complex um, actually had a bunch of people in it that liked to smoke cigarettes and marijuana at about 5 a.m., so being on the bottom level with no air ventilation system in the entire building, the smoke, who gets up at 5 a.m. to smoke? That's ridiculous. But the smoke would fall down and our bathroom would be full of cigarette smoke. So Angel would wake up to go to work at 5 a.m. She wouldn't get home till 7 to 8 a.m. because of traffic, or 7 or 8 p.m. because of traffic. And it was completely miserable. Well, come to find out, uh, after being there for about three weeks, we saw this posting about an infestation in the apartment complex. Yeah. We totally quarantined our house. We, put, we, we ate out for about six weeks straight um, at Chipotle. I didn't even want Chipotle. I love Chipotle. I didn't even want Chipotle after that. It was absolutely miserable. We found cockroaches in our kitchen. Oh, my goodness. It was just disgusting. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. We threw out all of our appliances. We sprayed the whole house down with powder. We packed up everything that we could, and we lived in misery for weeks upon weeks. And there have been other things that we've gone through, um, but the thing that got Angel through, and she'll tell you this, she got a book, uh, she got it on paperback and CD called A Thousand Gifts of Giving Thanks. And every day, she would listen to this audio recording of, of a woman who was reading her book and giving thanks for a thousand different gifts. And so Angel's job every day was to write down things that she was thankful for, and that got her through. Finally, we were able to move a little bit closer. Angel got a different job at Under Armour, and things started to work out a lot better. But man, if she would not have given thanks in that moment, she, she probably wouldn't have made it. And that's what Paul does here, is the first and foremost, this guy is in prison, and he says, I give thanks for you always. I mention you always in my prayers. And you know, we go through a lot of stuff. We go through tribulation, tough circumstances, tough relationships, the church might not be the church that we want, or things might not be done how we want, or we might feel unhappy at the church that we're at. We go through difficulties, but here's this key phrase, is that giving thanks sets the proper tone and attitude and perspective when dealing with life's most difficult situations. Learning to give thanks for what you have in the hardest moments sets the tone and attitude and perspective for the bad things that you go through. Paul said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, in everything, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You don't pass a class, you don't get the job that you want, something tragic happens to you, somehow, some way, give thanks. And it is one of the hardest things to do at being a follower of Jesus. Man, when you go through rough moments, and I've been through some rough moments in my short life here on earth, and in that moment, all I want to do is cry out to God and tell him how angry I am and how disappointed I am and why would he let me go through this and why is this happening to me? But yet in the midst of that, I remind myself, take a moment and give thanks to God. You know, Paul actually wrote in Romans, he says, uh, give thanks for your troubled circumstances. Can you imagine giving thanks to God for the hardships that you go through? Not just giving thanks for the good, but giving thanks for the bad because you know God is at work. And that is the toughest thing, is that we're walking through this clouded veil that we're unsure of what's going to happen tomorrow or what's going to take place or why God's sending us through this. But yet, the proper attitude is to give thanks through the difficult moments. 
Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says this, always give thanks to God the Father of everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul sets this tone of giving thanks and he says, I pray with joy. Now remember, he's in prison and joy is mentioned 16 times in the book of Philippians, which only has a few chapters. It is a, a central tone, you could say, to the book. It's to give thanks because joy is in Christ. It's not just a mood that you have, right? I'm joyful today and I'm not joyful tomorrow, but it is an attitude. It is a deep confidence that God is in control and I have victory in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul's imprisonment did not diminish his joy because that joy was grounded in something much deeper than a jail cell or much deeper than a beating or much deeper than a starvation, much deeper than being naked or or shipwrecked. Paul's joy was founded in his relationship with God. And what I want to ask you this morning to reflect on as we go through this point is simply this. What are you going through that is fighting for the basis of your joy? Are you comparing yourself with other people? Is it tragedy? Is it conflict? Is it disappointment? Is it discouragement? Is it failure? Is it discontentment? What is it that you are going through that is fighting for the basis of your joy? He says, I look in the past, and I am thankful for your partnership in the gospel. You see, the Philippians, they gave him a a large charitable contribution so that Paul could travel and so that he could preach. And he says, I am thankful for you. And guess what? What God started back then when I came to preach the gospel to you, God has a plan for you. And if you'll notice what we read, he goes on to say that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God is not finished with you yet, is what Paul's writing to the Philippians. And if there's an encouragement that I could give you this morning, is that whatever you go through, whether good or bad, God is not finished with you yet. He is going to continue the good work that he started back when you were immersed into Christ, however many years or days ago. And sometimes we can lose that feeling. You know how joyful we are and how awesome we feel and wonderful it is and then life smacks us in the face a a short day uh, later or a few days later and we go back to the struggles. God isn't done with us. God is working through our testimony and through our lives and we have to persevere. We have to grow. We have to experience the richness and the fullness of Christ. That's what God has called us to do. Look what he says in verse 7. He says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about all of you because I have you where? In my heart. It's okay to feel love for each other. It's okay to feel hope for each other. And he says, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of this grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. This is a witness of a deep, passionate emotion of Paul. He says, I love you with the affection of Jesus Christ himself. You know, sometimes we say, yeah, man, love you like a brother, or hey, sister so-and-so, or something of that nature, and it, it can become this commonplace term that we use, but when we say things like that, it is the most deepest, affectionate, tender, caring, unconditional love that you can ever imagine. Being a Christian The love that we share between each other is supposed to be stronger than the love that you have with even your own blood. That's how deep Paul is invoking his love. He says, God as my witness, with the love of Jesus Christ himself, he's invoking the Godhead, the deity, the creator of the universe as a witness to testify the type of love and care he has for these people. Who are you loving like this, is the question. Who are you caring for like this? Who brings you joy like this? You see, these types of words of affirmation, it can really make the difference in somebody's life. And as we go through this letter, as you focus on your joy, understand that other people around you have difficult times too. They go through life just like you do. And man, what a world of difference you can make if you build somebody up with love and hope and happiness and encouragement. Because let's face it, life is tough. Look at verse 9 with me. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in the real knowledge and discernment. Wait a second. I thought love was just an emotional feeling. No. He says, with discernment and with knowledge. So that you may approve of the things that are excellent. Just because it feels right, just because it feels good, 
doesn't mean it's of the love of God. He says, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. You see, his prayer of thanksgiving and joy is covered with the love of growing in in glory. Now think about this for a second. It's not enough for Paul to just say, give thanks, and then I'm joyful, but he's giving us encouragement here. And this is, this is where we're going to park. That he is saying this, if you want to be thankful, if you want to be joyful, then you need to focus on loving one another and growing with one another. This type of love is not just a feeling, it's not just a bookish kind of knowledge, but it is genuine love that has moral insight that can discern between what is right and what is wrong. When it comes to relationships, or when it comes to morality, or when it comes to doing that which is right and wrong, our emotions cannot be our guide. We have to have our emotions along with our mind, thinking through these things and the knowledge of Jesus. There are a lot of things to me that feel right, but are completely immoral and wrong. Sometimes it feels right to lie. Sometimes it feels right to lust. Sometimes it feels right to steal. Sometimes it feels right to be angry or hateful. These are all things that we all go through and we would lie if we say that we wouldn't. But we must allow the love to be in the confinements of the truth of the gospel. That the word dictates how we feel, which dictates what we do. That is what Paul is talking about here. And he says, I want you to have abounding love overflowing. I want you to picture a cup up on the stage that I just keep pouring water into and it overflows and it runs and it touches everyone. That's the type of love that Paul was saying that we should have. And the reason why we should have this abounding, hopeful, exceeding, overwhelming love is simply this. He says that you may approve of that which may be best, that you may approve of the things that are excellent, You see, it's simply this. Our final key phrase is this, is that love weighs matters in view of the deep purposes of God and makes decisions that carry them into action. What should you do when you have a decision? What should you do when you have an emotion or a feeling or you to make a choice? What Paul is saying here is you need to ask yourself a question. Is this God's will? Is this what God would have us do? And this is something that as parents, as leaders in the church, as partakers of our families, we have to make decisions collectively together. And I think God would have us all come together and say, well, what is God's will? And where do you find God's will? Right here in the New Testament. This is what our lives must be based on and focused on, the word of God. And the only way you can figure out God's will is to open up this book and read it for yourself. We already saw, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, that it is God's will for you to give thanks in everything. And there's a whole lot more in there that God wants you to experience and see. And he he ends it with this, that you may not only approve what is right and wrong with the love of Jesus, but you may be a pure person and blameless. To be pure means this, one whose mind is sincere and is honest and isn't polluted by the things that does not come from God. To be pure means to not be polluted with the things that do not come from God. And he says, I want you to be blameless. Do not cause others to stumble. So he's saying, in view of Christ's return, his imminent return, Jesus will come back one day. I want you to live in such a way that you don't cause other people to trip up and fall into sin. He says, I want you to be filled with joy and the fruit of righteousness. I want you to reflect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, honesty, truthfulness, goodness, and faithfulness. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You see, Paul gridlocks, he buries the foundation to be a righteous, loving, unified person in who? In Jesus. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10 says this, He says, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That is Paul's plan for us, that our lives would be impacted in such a way that we would bear him fruit. We're getting ready to go into a time where we get to please God by focusing on his broken body and the blood that he shed for us And here at Severn Christian Church, um, we take two things. One is a a cup of the fruit of the vine, grape juice. 
which is Jesus' blood. And he sat down with his disciples right before he was ready to be crucified. And you know what Jesus did? He gave thanks. The Bible says that he took out this bread and he broke it. And he handed it to them and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise it says he took out the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is the blood of the covenant which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And it says that he sat there with his disciples and he gave thanks. What an amazing God that we serve. That this is a time where we reflect on giving thanks and having joy and reminding ourselves that this is why we exist. This is why we're here. This is what Jesus did for us. And so I'm going to pray about this communion and I pray that you will focus on your relationship with God, that you'll remember not just the busy week or what went right or what went wrong, but that you'll focus on your Lord and Savior and what he did for you and what he will continue to do for you. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this time that we get to come together and we get to share in the bread and the blood of Jesus, his body, love Father, that was broken for us, that was shed for the remission of our sins. God, we know that we don't deserve it. We know that we're unworthy. God, I remember right now, I have in my mind what he went through on the cross, what he endured through his beatings, how his flesh was torn, how his body was broken, and that whole time he was thinking about me. He was thinking about all of us. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the fact that he showed us how to have joy and how to give thanks even in the darkest of times. Thank you for sending us the light of your word and your truth. Father, as we take the bread, which is your body, and the cup, which is your blood, I pray that we will be strengthened, we will be encouraged, and we will remember forever and always that you died for us and you gave your life for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.